So now that you have installed Events in Tree, what do we do next? If you open the Events Entry Management console, the welcome screen will give you some hints on what you can do next. A suggested first step is to add hosts to the Events Entry Management console and then deploy agents to those remote hosts. And finally, open the web reports to review the data that's being collected by those hosts. So in this example, I'll add a workstation to Events Entry. And we have several ways of adding computers to event entry. We can add them manually, or we can import them, or we can link a group to Active Directory. We can also do network discovery. So if you click the import button here, I will show you how each of these import uh, functions look like. If we select file, then we simply point to a text file that has one host name per line, or if the computer has an IP address associated with it, uh, comma separated value list. If we're importing from the network, we get a list of domains to choose from. By clicking next, we subsequently get a list of all the hosts in that workgroup domain. If you select Active Directory, we can import hosts. And here you can browse your Active Directory structure and either select an organizational unit, which contains you know, one or more host objects, or you can uh, select a group which may contain uh, one or more computer objects. We can do a network scan where we enter an IP address and optionally uh, specify TCP ports if ping is disabled. So to keep things simple here, I'm going to import from the network. I'm going to choose the test ground domain workgroup. In this case, this is a domain, but workgroups would be listed here as well. And I'm going to pick test 16, which is a Windows 7 64-bit workstation. And hit next, hit finish, and that's how easy it is. The computer has been added. We can do a check status first to make sure we have access to that computer. We're going to click OK. We do have access to that computer because we get an error message saying that the specified service does not exist as an installed service, so the agent is not yet deployed for that computer. Deployment is incredibly easy. We simply click Deploy Agent and click OK and watch the progress of the deployment tool here. The deployment tool definitely provides feedback here and here we can see that the agent was successfully installed, uh, which agent version we have on the remote host and the configuration revision. So the configuration revision is just a sequential number that gets increased anytime you save the configuration. And you can always view what the current revision on the management console is by clicking on the host name and looking on the top right here, you can see that we have configuration revision 3. So whenever you're managing agents and you can see that they're on an older revision, that means that they may not have the latest configuration. The Events Entry Management Console, and more specifically the user who's logged in, does need access to the admin dollar share in order to deploy an agent. If you don't have access to that uh, admin dollar share, you can still deploy uh, an agent manually, and you can do that by creating an MSI file with Event Entry. How do you create an MSI file? It's very easy. You click on Computer Groups, or you can also click on the Groups tab in the ribbon, and you click on the Agent Deployment. And there you have two options. You can either just create a configuration file. That allows you to uh, install the agent manually just from the command line, or you can create an MSI file. We're going to get an error message here because the MSI creation, the Wix toolset is not installed on this uh, host. But if we install the Wix toolset, then all it takes to create an MSI file is literally uh, pressing a couple of buttons and you have an MSI that you can simply run on the remote host, either manually or as part of a deployment procedure. If you have an image, for example, you can simply integrate that MSI file and install the agent uh, automatically. Probably just want to keep it up to date uh, to a certain point whenever you make uh, substantial changes to Events Entry. Otherwise, um, if they are on an older configuration, then that's not a problem. As soon as they check in with the collector, they'll pull the latest configuration and update themselves. So the only important thing would be to make sure that the uh, collector hostname hasn't changed uh, since the time you've created the MSI file. So we've done step one and two. So we've deployed at least one agent at this point. So now let's access to web reports. And if we take a look now, we'll see that our new host, test16, is online. 
it's created uh, 818 events so far and it will be showing up in some of the other tiles as well at some point. You can take a look at the network status page for example. So we can take a look at the host inventory page for example. And we can see the new host here. It's a Windows 7 Professional 64-bit host, virtual machine, VMware, 4 gigs of memory installed. Um, you can see the software that's installed, so there's really not much on there other than a web browser. You can see some recent logons here from the same user account and how long the logon was and any sort of documentation. And that's another great feature in Event Center. You can add notes to a host or global notes um, to kind of document what's going on in your network. So in this particular case, I'm going to tag test 16. I'm going to say change configuration reduced RAM from 6 gigs to 4 gigs. We'll say add entry. And now we have a note here stored associated with that host. So anybody who views the host inventory page or who accesses the notes will see we'll see this comment here. So it's a great way to document things on your network. You can even add attachments. So if you have some sort of warranty document, some network documentation, you can simply upload those. But well, that's enough with the web report. So let's close those and let's get back to the management console. So I've already shown how to add hosts to groups. So let's take a look at the packages. As you can see here, and I'm gonna collapse everything here to make things a little more clear. As you can see here, we have four different types of packages available. Event log packages, log file packages, system help, and compliance tracking. Packages are assigned either globally to a group or to individual hosts. Here you can see that all these packages that have the little globe icon are global packages. That means any host that's monitored by Event Century, regardless of the group membership, is going to use and utilize this package. The laptop package does not. To assign a package and to see to which host it's assigned to, we can simply click the Assign button and we'll see that it's only assigned to the default group. Event Center has another useful feature that makes it very easy to assign packages, and that's the dynamic activation feature. If you take a look at the MS Exchange Server package, so this is a package that would only be useful for servers running Microsoft Exchange Server which contains rules that are only relevant for Microsoft Exchange servers. So instead of manually assigning this package to all of your Exchange servers, what you can do is you can simply dynamically assign this package only to servers that are actually running Microsoft Exchange Server. And we can do that uh, by clicking Package Properties. Now if you take a look at the log file packages, those are packages for monitoring log files, such as DHCP logs, IS logs, for example, or any other log that's present on a Windows system. So it could be a structured log file, a delimited log file, which refers to log files that follow a specific pattern. So that would be DHCP or IIS. Or it could just be a flat log file that just basically contains text that does not follow any specific pattern where you can extract fields such as debug logs, for example, or the Windows Update log. System Health contains packages for system health monitoring, so you'll find disk space, performance monitoring, all those sorts of things in there, hardware software inventory, all of that in there. Most of these sections include the filter capability, so if we wanted to say, okay, let's only look at performance monitoring packages, then you can filter right here. And finally, we have the compliance tracking security section. So here is where you configure process tracking, log on, log off tracking, active directory, account management, and those sort of things, as well as file access tracking. And finally, we have the action section. This is a little bit short here. We only have email and database actions, but Event Sentry supports many different action types. So if you click the Add button in the ribbon here, you'll see all the different actions Event Sentry supports. So in addition to email and database, you can launch a process. You can send data event logs via syslogs for remote hosts. We can send SNMP traps. We can interact with HTTP APIs. We can store logs in a file. We can reboot a server in response to an event. We can control services and processes. 
So there's a lot of things you can do to interact with other systems, integrate with other systems, as well as take corrective action. Event Sentry also contains a built-in event log viewer. So you can see that here. So if you wanted to take action based on the event, you can simply right-click the event and add include or exclude filters, for example, uh, to take to configure the rules right here from the event viewer. And we also have an application and services event logs uh, built-in viewer here, which is very useful actually and a lot more, a lot faster and easier to use than the built-in event view from, from Windows. To finish things up, I'm going to show you the default packages that we have in place to determine what type of email alerts uh, you'll be receiving. There's two packages here that, I, that are very relevant. One is email notification. If we expand that package, we'll see four filters here. And filters are the rules that determine what goes where. So anything here in the event log packages is all in response to events in one of, from one of the Windows event logs. So here you'll see that the email audit failures rule set is disabled, it's, it's grayed out. Uh, if you, normally what that would do, it, it would forward all odd failures to your email action. And here we also have the email critical events filter, which is also disabled, which would be sending you any warnings or errors or critical errors from any of the monitored event logs, which can be a lot. The filters that we have enabled, which is what we configured uh, post-installation the configuration system, are any sort of error that's logged by event entry, as well as any sort of warning that's been logged by event entry, is going to be forwarded to our default email action. If you look at the threshold tab here, we're making sure that we only get up to 10 events, so only 10 warnings per one hour sent to us, which can still be a lot. And this is configured on the agent side. So if you switch that to the collector side, then that will mean that you will only get 10 event entry warnings per hour from all of your monitored hosts. Whereas agent side means you will only get up to 10 event entry warnings per monitored host. Another package that's installed by default if you use a database is the database consolidation package. And this contains the rules that determine which events will go to your database. Again, audit success is disabled. We can enable that simply by right-clicking, saying enable. And the rule here is very simple. It simply says any audit success from the security event log will go to the primary database. This audit failure is exactly the same, except that the audit failure checkbox is checked. The consolidated non-security events is pretty much the same thing, except all the logs except for security, monitoring the information warning and error types. It also monitors some of the applications and services logs that are commonly useful, such as Windows Backup, DNS Server, Hyper-V, PowerShell, and so forth. So this is where you control what goes into the database. And you can create multiple. You can add exclusion filters here to customize that. Um, you can enable some of the filters here. If you're saying, you know, I really want to get email, I really want to get critical events from the Windows event log, then you can enable that here. The last component we'll look at are the network services. If you're looking to receive syslog or SMP traps, then this is the component that's responsible for that. You can just configure the components right here. For example, here we have syslog enabled for UDP and the TCP protocol. We are accepting messages from all hosts. And we're sending them all to the primary database. You can also log syslog, incoming syslog events to the event log by enabling this checkbox here and setting up specific filters. It allows you to uh, set up uh, email alerts, for example, when a specific uh, warning or error comes from a non-Windows device via syslog. SNP trap daemon works exactly the same way, except that you'll also want to configure uh, communities at SNP version 3 authentication. The ARPWatch daemon watches out for new MAC addresses, detects spoof attempts, and NetFlow simply receives NetFlow messages, NetFlow packets from a router, for example, or a firewall, and stores them in the database and allows you to visualize network traffic. That's pretty much it. I hope this was helpful and gets you started with the Vincentry. Thank you for watching.